No standing eight box of podcast. We discuss every organization and weight class. With your host, Bronx Bomber, educated with the craft. Punch a topic hard like heavyweights hitting the bag from the top rank to the upcoming. Washed up to the dark horse. Champs, number one contenders. Quick jab or sharp cross. We saw Come get it. Tuning in, you can have it. Internationally known. Our information is valid. See, we on a higher plane. No two episodes the same. We get better as we train, so on top we remain. Come join the conversation, the same sight you gain. And outside of the rain, we do the damn thing. All right, fight fans, welcome to another edition of No Stand A Boxing Talk. I am your host, the Bronx Barber, and today I have with me veteran boxing referee. Ricky Gonzalez. Ricky, how are you doing today? Very good, very good. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me. All right. Well, listen, man, uh, I appreciate you taking time to come talk to, uh, you know, be on my show today and talk to your fights. And uh, so much about boxing, so much about uh, uh, boxers and a, and a match is the third person in the ring. Uh, and that's uh, the, the referee. But you guys get more hate than you do love. And today is all about uh, giving love to the guys that, Go in there and, and arbitrate these fights and make sure that the rules are being followed and, and that the fighters are fighting cleanly. Uh, but uh, first and foremost, I, you're one of the top boxer refs in boxing. People know who you are. But just in case, awesome. for those that don't know you, give us a little bit about your background, where you're from, uh, you know, uh, and how you got started in this whole boxing thing. All right. Um, I, I got into boxing uh, through my father. My uh, my father was a huge huge boxing fan. Uh, come from you know him b- being born in Puerto Rico, he uh, he got involved with the sport in Puerto Rico. When he moved to New York, um, he had five kids, including myself, four boys, one girl. We would buy us boxing gloves and we would spar with each other. So that's pretty much how the love of boxing came for me. Um, when I got when I got married, uh, my 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 ex wife's cousin was also involved in boxing. He was a, an amateur boxer, so I used to go with him to the gym. And one day, they needed an official, and it so happens to be that I was there at the time. They asked me if I wanted to officiate. I was like, Yeah, sure, you know. And uh, <laughs> that was actually the beginning of uh, of my of my career, my officiating career. Uh, I was raised in Queens. Mm-hmm. Born in Brooklyn, raised in Queens. Then I became a police officer at the age of 20. And um, I did 20 years in the NYPD. I retired in 2004. The year that I retired, I turned pro as a referee. Nice, nice. And so you say that uh, your dad introduced you to the sport. He was a big, you know, boxing fan. Did, did you ever compete uh, as an amateur boxer? I didn't compete, but I did a lot of sparring. I did a lot of sparring with, with uh, guys that were going into the Golden Gloves, but I never competed myself. So I did it, I did it for about three years, from maybe from the age of 15 to about the age of 18. And, uh, but then I always kept myself in shape by doing the, you know, the boxing routine from that point on. How has boxing uh, contributed at all, if any, to your life as a police officer? Discipline. Discipline, right, right off the bat, discipline, um, uh, awareness. Um, I was able to, to focus better as a street cop. I spent my whole career in Brooklyn, Red Stuy, Crown Heights, all the best neighborhoods, <laughs> so to speak, right? Um, so, you know, through boxing, it, it taught me a lot of discipline and, and self awareness. So I was able to, you know, keep my keep focus as, as to what was going on in the street. I worked midnights. It was it was very difficult for a lot of guys to to concentrate, especially during that shift. But for me, for some reason, it was it was pretty easy. And I guess it had a lot to do with the boxing. Good stuff. Good stuff. You said that you fell into boxing by just ad hoc impromptu. You were there. Hey, we need a referee. You get in. And I'm sure that uh, after that fight, what did you say to yourself? Man, this is something I want to do. Yeah, like Im- immediately, it was just like it was it was a love. Immediately, it was a love, you know. So I joined the the LBC, the local boxing commission, um, and uh, USA Boxing. 
So I started officiating from that point on. I was like maybe 1998, 1999. Um, started judging a lot of fights, refing a lot of fights. Um, I did both. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a tremendous experience, you know? Um, and then in the back of my mind, while I was doing that, I was like, wow, you know, maybe one day I can turn pro. So I started asking questions and I was told that you need to, to have at least five years in the amateurs and 300, between 300 and 500 bouts under your belt before you can turn pro. So my, my fifth year, I had, uh, it exceeded that, that amount tremendously. So I, uh, I said to myself, you know, when I, when I retire, I'm going to go to the commission's office, hand in my resume and, and, and you know, see what happens. And this, the day that I went there, as soon as I retired, they took me in immediately. Um, so it was, it was, you know, I was, I was blessed to, to be, you know, to get, to get the access into, into the commission from that point. You say they took you in immediately. Is there a selective process? Are they very selective, or they just let anybody like kind of be a referee? No, no, they're 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 very selective. But I think what helped me was my 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 background with the police department. Gotcha. So when when uh when I went to the commissioner's office at that time, we had gotten a new commissioner. His name was Ron Ron Scott Stevens, and um so when I when I went in, I handed in my resume. He's looking it over. And he's like, oh, you know, you know, this is you you're, you're the exact type of person that we want in the commission, somebody with that kind of background. And then I see, you know, with, with your, your amateur boxing career, um, there's, there's a lot of fights that you've done. So he took, he took me immediately. I was, you know, I just, it was just, it was, I was blessed to, to be there, you know, at the right time. You, uh, you have officiated some of the biggest fights uh, recently uh, within the last few years, you know, you know, I've seen you on TV. And uh, when I watch these fights, how many, how many uh, sanctioned boxing matches professionally have do you have under your belt? Um, I have over three hundred and fifty professional fights. Three hundred fifty professional fights. How many of those have been world titles? Uh, honestly, I, I, I can't. I can't. I can't name them. You know, I, I couldn't tell you right off right off hand. But uh, there's been you know quite a few. I've been blessed to, to have done quite a few. Other sports like uh, bo- uh, baseball and. Uh, and basketball and football, when it comes time for the playoffs or when it comes time for uh, the World Series or championship games, they're very selective of what officiators they pick to do those games. Is it the same way in boxing? Are they very selective or who gets to who, who gets to ref a world title fight? They they are. They are. You know, um, they uh, they have a rotation uh, system. But with that being said, they also know who can handle certain bouts or certain uh weight divisions so um based on you know your, your past performance past performances they they kind of like gauge it gauge that from 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 that you heard 50 bouts you've done some world title bouts uh what, what was one of your most memorable bouts that you refereed um honestly right off the back i would have to say canelo uh, Madison Square Garden when he made his debut in the Garden. Um, that was uh, it was a tremendous, tremendous atmosphere. Um, the crowd went berserk. Uh, it was just um, the adrenaline. The adrenaline was 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 kicking in to high gear. Um, it was it was it was it was a great great night. Great night. Well, how does a referee prepare for a boxing match? You guys got to do homework, study fighters, or you just strictly adhere to the rules that you have to abide by. Well, you know, basically what I, what I do is like, if I know I have a championship fight coming up, I'll, uh, you know, look at tapes of that fighter just to kind of like see their style. And if they're, you know, they, they come in with their head or if they, if they, you know, um, if they do certain things that can possibly lead to, to a file, a file. Um, so yeah, you know, basically that's, that's the homework that I do. Um, but on um, you know on top of that, um, every referee is different. They do things differently, um, and uh, you know like there's some guys that like to work out. There's some guys that don't. You know they figure they'll, they'll you know they'll do their working out once they're in the ring. You know so I like to I like to stay physically prepared all year round. So when I do that championship fight or or it could be a four rounder, you know I'm ready to 
I'm ready physically and emotionally to to you know to do the fight. Yeah, because it could be it could be physical, but you guys are constantly on your feet. You're constantly moving around. Sometimes you got to break up fighters, and that that has to be you know, especially if you break it up a heavyweight fight. I can only imagine like trying to pull those guys apart. Do you do you guys yeah. just put your arms on? Or do you actually physically sometimes have to push them apart. Oh no, sometimes I have to physically push them apart. But let, let, let me tell you though, <laughs> it's not not just the, the heavyweights. I did I did Tank Davis right his uh-huh. his very very first championship fight, right against uh, Pedraza. Uh-huh. Let me tell you, that guy was 130 pounds. When I went to break him, I felt like I was trying to break a heavyweight. He was that strong. So I pushed myself off of him, and I'm, I'm saying to myself, damn, is, is this guy a heavyweight or what? You know, it was, it was pure muscle, you know? I bet, but, man. You guys in the ring, man, uh, are the subject of heavy criticism by, by, by the media, by the fans, by the boxers themselves. Sometimes you guys get no love. First of all, you don't get any attention at all. And when you do, it's almost always negative. I never hear, hardly ever do I hear somebody say, man, that referee is on point. That referee did a good job. Uh, so have you ever been in a situation where you made a call uh, that you were criticized, uh, you know, not just in the media, but actually confronted by a boxer or a fan or somebody? Um, not, not, not so much um, the boxer. You know, because honestly, wh- whether you're, you, you're doing the correct thing as far as stopping a fight, the boxer, even if he's getting a beat down, he's always going to complain because he wants to he wants to finish on his feet. He doesn't want to take that defeat. So, you know, I, I understand that. But there have been times when a promoter would start complaining about a stoppage. Um, I'm not going to name the promoters, but... But the, yeah, that, there have been cases like that um, where, you know, the promoter was complaining that the, the fight was, was stopped too soon or was, it was stopped too late. And each time I have to admit that uh, the commission always had my back, that I did the correct thing. And I'm, not, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, but, you know, those particular instances uh, that I did the correct thing. I mean, what is the correct thing? I mean, sometimes we sit here and we watch these fights and, and we criticize uh, referees. I mean, some notable referees like like Jay Dady is known for <laughs> amongst us for stopping fights too early. You know, uh, Richard Richard Steele got criticized for stopping the Melvin Taylor who does say on Chavez fight with only like four seconds left on the clock. They, you know, and, and that's just he. And sometimes he was blamed for why Melvin Taylor lost that fight. You know, and and you guys get a rap that what is. Are there guidelines? What what what's your trainer tell you of when it is a you know t- stop a fight, take a point? What's too many warnings? What's too little warnings? What what are the guidelines? Well, you know, if a guy is taking a beat down, like the referee's in the ring. So if a guy's taking a beat down, and if that referee deems that this person's life is possibly in danger, he's gonna do what he has to do. If he has to stop that fight, he's gonna stop that fight. Unfortunately, there's some guys that have waited too long to jump in. And there are guys that maybe stopped it a little too early. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, those boxes, thank God, they were able to, to live another day. Um, so it all, you know, it, it all depends on, 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 on the referee and, 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 and the situation at hand. Um, you know, you want to give a guy a chance, especially if it's a championship fight. But at the same token, you don't want him to to suffer a severe beatdown. Yeah, I I assume they although you guys have your guidelines and whatnot, but I I guess all of that is totally subjective. That's totally on the ref. I, I right, mean, right. The other day, I forgot what fight I was watching, but that ref wasn't playing. I mean, he gave a he he deducted a point off the bat, no warning, deducted a point. Uh, okay. Sometimes they say, for example, uh, the the Pritchard Cologne case. Uh, you know, it was highly criticized. The referee was highly criticized for that for that fight, and said that had maybe had he issued at least one point deduction or one warning, it may have prevented the other fighter from hitting Pritchard Cologne beside the head. You know, you know, in the back of the head. So yeah, that's um, that was that was very critical. You know, um, in fact, like during the uh, instructions when I when I give instructions, and most of the referees now because of that, um, when you give the instructions, you make the fighters aware that that is a severe penalty immediately if there's 
two punches behind the head. One, you're going to get that, that harsh warning. Second time around behind the head, there's not going to be a third time. It's going to be a second. The second time you do it, penalty. So for you, that's that's one of those uh, critical warnings, you know, hit behind the head. Uh, yes. There's no tolerance. One warning, second one, point deduction. Right, right, gotcha. right. Yes. yes. Gotcha. Uh, normally, any any other file, you know, file, you know maybe uh, hitting below the belt, you know, kidney shot, you know, you, you're going to give them two warnings, and then the next one, the next file will, will be an automatic uh, point deduction. Yeah, that's not why I see two, and then usually a point deduction. And right. uh, what's your methodology? What's your approach to refing a fight? Um, well, basically, you know, I try to stay out of the way. You know, I'm in there. I try to keep my distance, but try to be close enough where I can see action. I always want to. I always want to be on my feet, constantly moving, because if there's if there's a, a critical situation where the guy is taking a beat down, I want to be able to get there quickly. If I'm stationary, I'm not going to be able to get there as fast as I can if I'm constantly on the move. Um, so that's that's my mindset. Um, you know, obviously, you know, of course, as I'm walking around the ring, I'm kind of like from, from, from point one to point, from point A to point B, I'm constantly moving around, observing these guys, making sure that they're fighting clean, fighting their fight. And, uh, and I, you know, just stay out the way until I have to, I have to intervene. Do you take your work home with you? Do you watch fight footage of yourself? No, 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 I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't do that at all. So once Absolutely. the fight's over, you leave it in the ring. That's it. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I, I never, I never, you know, I never watched myself. Um, you know, um, I, I did in the beginning of my career because you know I was still learning, and 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 I'm not saying that I'm not learning. I'm still not learning, but it's just, you know, I don't. To me, it's like having a negative effect. I don't want to watch myself, you know. Um, but um, but you know, I uh. You know, I, 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 I do um, study the fighters before I go into the ring. Uh, like I said, you know, I want to know their styles and uh, if they're capable of committing certain files. files. So I want to be aware of all that. Um, and then, of course, going into the dressing room when you, when you speak to the fighters, you, you address that. And then, you know, you also ask that fighter if they have any concerns for their, their opponent. Is there a fight or a moment you wish you could have back? Um, no, actually, they, <laughs> no, they've, they've all, you know, I've, all, I've been, I've been blessed, man, with, with the fights that I've done, you know, and they were all learning experiences. Um, uh, but no, 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 I, you know, I, I, if I had to do it all over again, same way, I, I, it would, I would appreciate that it would happen that same way. You stand by all your calls. Yes, yes, 100%. 100%. What's, I notice sometimes that the referees go back and forth in between breaks to the corners. What are you looking for? Okay, so what, what I do is in between, in between rounds, I want to observe the fighter to see if maybe I missed a cut. So I'm looking for that to see if I missed a cut. If the, the guy's bleeding, I'm like, oh, shit, I didn't see, you know, I didn't see that. You know? And, if, and if, that, if that was the case... Then I will go to my alternate ref to ask him if he saw, you know, such and such. So that's what I'm doing. When I go to go to the corner to observe the fighter between rounds, that's exactly what we're doing to see if there are any cuts or, you know, any lacerations or anything of that nature. The other sports, uh, baseball in particular, uh, they've, they've, they've adopted measures of uh, instant replays, the red flags to challenge missed calls. Is is boxing leaning that way? Uh, what, what's the future of that? I I 100% believe so. Um, they're doing that right now in the Mohegan Sun. I actually did a fight last week in the Mohegan Sun, and they have the instant replay. Okay. Do you so, think that? Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, 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 no! I was gonna say, you know, so it's. I think it's great. I think it's fantastic because we're we're human, you know. And they have it. They have instant replay in all these other sports. Why not boxing? Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense, especially even more boxing where a fighter's life is on the line and you know especially when a fight's close uh you know the difference between a a punch landing and opening a cut and the, the headbutt opening a cut that that's significant you know because right 
and and also also if a, if a fighter slips and the referee calls it a knockdown because let's say a punch was thrown but it didn't land and he fell so you know that kind of thing so if they can correct that uh within a minute in between rounds then then it's fantastic only you know that that enhances the sport uh i see that it's common practice for the referee to say hey walk towards me do you want to fight what are you looking for from that fighter to let the fight go on? You know, every fighter feels like they the fight should be stopped short, you know? Some other right. ones, I look and I'll be like, whoa, man. That guy was clearly answering your question. That guy looked like he was not hurt, man. You know, but again, I'm sitting at home, you know, probably eating some fucking Cheetos and drinking beer. I'm not in there like you, you know what I'm saying? What are you looking for? <laughs> All right. Well, if, if a boxer gets knocked down, I'll give him the mandatory eight. Then I'm going to have him step, take two steps to, to the side and then come back towards me. What I'm looking for to, are, are his legs, his knees, to see if they're wobbly as he's walking towards me. If they're wobbly as he's walking towards me, I'm going to call the fight off because there's no reason why I'm going to let it continue. When he's already wobbly, this guy is going to put a pounding on him. So, so yeah, that's what I'm looking for, to see if his legs are wobbly. If his legs are, uh, are strong and, and, and he's ready to go, he looks ready to go, then, then I'll let it go. What are some of the challenges that you, you face as a referee? Um, challenges. Uh, well, you know, every referee, when they go into the ring, they want to have that bout where it's clean. There's no controversy, you know, because like, like you said, you know, we're, we're, we're the focus, we're the focus when it, when it comes to a referee doing something, you know, wrong or, so you want to have that you want to you want to have that fight going in the ring where okay this is going to be a clean fight one from one to twelve and you know but of course things happen you know so you know um, those you know those are the challenges you know you you want to just make sure that you do what you're supposed to do stay out of controversy and make sure that these guys are, these guys finish the fight and can go home to their families. Gotcha. I mean. That you know, listen, the fight game and fighters, especially in boxing, there's little things that they do to gain an advantage. Like they'll punch a, they'll punch a guy in the thigh, you know, you know, so when you're not looking, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll throw an elbow in there a little bit. They'll rub their head. They'll, you know, do some body weight, you know, put their body weight on them. I, I, I guess those are some of the things that you have to look for. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure you already know the fighters ahead of time that are probably more likely to do that. That's true. <laughs> no, no, that's true. That is true. You know, some 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 fighters are more susceptible to doing things like that than others. But yeah. uh, but yes, correct. <laughs> Not many names because I know there's an integrity part that and, and, a, and a biased part that you must maintain, an unbiased part that you must maintain when it comes to this. So we're gonna leave names out of this, man. But I, I know, man. I, I, I before the fight even starts, I mean, this guy's a sushi. I know he's already gonna. About <laughs> 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 Ricky the referee. I want to talk about Ricky the person, man. I see you got a Roberto Duran shirt, man. Manos de piedras, uh, hands of oh, snow. Man. Why are you rocking yeah. that? Oh, man, I'll tell you, since, since I was uh, through my father, again, he was a huge Roberto Duran fan. Roberto Duran fought Sugar Ray Leonard the first time. Um, my father took me to the garden. That was the first time I saw a live fight. So he took me to the garden to see the fight through closed circuit, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it was also live fights as well. Gotcha. So... I became a huge uh, Duran fan, and then when I um, when I when I when I got to to do some traveling with boxing, I did a, I did a championship fight in Panama. I actually got to meet Duran at his restaurant, and it was like I felt like I was a kid at Christmas, you know. So um, it was it was amazing because when I got to his restaurant, they told him that I was gonna that I was on, on my way there, and that I was a huge fan of his. And I mean I mean apparently he he knew who I was. I was I was shocked. He was waiting for me outside the restaurant. So when, when I got there, he opened his arms and he gave me a kiss on my cheek. Wow. Man, I, I'm telling you, man, I felt like I saw Santa. I bet you <laughs> did. I bet you did. I mean, he's one of my yeah. superstars. My wall over here, I got, I got my legends and he's right on top up there. I don't know if you can see him. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I see that. I see that. Yes, right there. Yep. <laughs> I got boxers everywhere, but that's the legends wall. That's another thing that I found out about referee Ricky Gonzalez, man. Listen. All of you that that follow the show, that those of you that know me, you know that box is my passion. The other thing you know that I, uh, my passion, you know, is my family. And the third thing is hip hop, because you know I'm from the Bronx. 
And the fourth <laughs> thing is South Star music, man. I am a hardcore South Star music head, man. And particularly my favorite bands all come from New York. Uh, a lot of people don't know, man. You got your Puerto Rican bands and you got your New York bands, you know? And, and man, I was right. big, big uh, Le- LeBron Brothers, Oqueta Broadway, Oqueta Flamboyan, <laughs> Uh, with Frankie Dante and Michael Dilo Diamond. I love all those guys, man. One thing you may not know about <laughs> Ricky is that Ricky plays the congas, man, and, and really, really freaking good, too, man. <laughs> How'd that come about? Wow. Um, I got to tell you, my, my father was also a musician in Puerto Rico. And uh, through my father, my brother, Jorge, he just, he, I'm going to get a little emotional. He just passed two weeks ago. He was... Um, a big salsero. He won. He won uh, two two Grammys. He played with Ray Barreto, uh, Ruben Blades, Celia Cruz, Tito Puente, all the big names you can think of. My brothers recorded almost 150 albums, wow. and uh, so I got that through him. I was I was his shadow growing up, and I would go with him to the clubs while he was performing with Larry Harlow and, and Ruben Blades and all these other bands, and it was. It was phenomenal. So, I, you know, during that time, I was also learning uh, to play percussion, bongos and, and congas. So um, that's pretty much how that came about. When, when I became a cop, I had to, I had to stop that, though. <laughs> what, uh, uh, what, what, what instrument did he play? Bongos. Bongos. Jorge Gonzalez, man, you know, rest in peace to your brother. My condolences to you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we, you know I, I do this thing uh, where uh, when, when a salsa artist passes away, that very Friday, I do an homenaje, and uh, you know, I, I just just here, just me and my wife, and and I play all their music, and, and I take a shot, uh, you know, in their name. I'm gonna do that for your brother this weekend, bro. Uh, thank you so much, man. I appreciate I'm, that. I'm gonna, look, I'm gonna look up his repertoire, uh, you know, yes. played on, and I'm gonna play those songs this Friday night, and uh, I'm I'm gonna uh, uh, have a few drinks in, in your brother's honor, man. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate cool. that. So yeah, man. Listen, I got congas too. I got, <laughs> I got bongos too. I got maracas. I got guitarra. I got, and I cannot play not one of these damn things now. After a few shots of Bacardi, I, I think. I, <laughs> <laughs> how hard? How how hard was it for you to learn, or did it just come innately to you? You know what's funny is that um, I love playing congas and, and and percussion with the bongos and all that. But for some reason, I never had the confidence in music like, like I do for boxing. Um, and then my brother would always get on me. He's like, come on, you know, you can do it, blah, blah, blah. blah. But I never had that confidence. I never had the, the confidence. So, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't push it. I, I didn't pursue it the way I did boxing. It's not too late, man. And you, you can find a school, <laughs> man, and, you know, get your, get your little groove on. Because the video I saw and that, and that solo cut you hit, that was just as good as I see any anybody do. So, oh, uh, thank you, man. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> this is so. When when Ricky's not boxing, what's Ricky doing? Joe, just chilling with my son, man. I have a sixteen year old, and and uh, you know, um, he and I are very, very, very tight, very close. He's a straight A student, you know, and um, I'm just trying to keep him in that straight path, you know, um, and just I'm a, I'm a I'm a boring guy, man. I don't I don't hang out. I don't, I don't go to bars. I don't drink. I don't smoke. Um, I never got drunk in my life. Again, I'm a boring guy, bro. You know, and um, you know, I watch Netflix, and you know, <laughs> and that's that's it, man. Ain't nothing boring about that, man. I'll tell you, man. <laughs> you know, especially when you, when you've experienced the life of a police officer, and you experienced, you know, like me, a soldier, and, and you've been to combat, and, and and you've been to combat in the streets of New York, which is a right. nightly thing for you for you guys. Uh, you appreciate the quiet life, man. You appreciate just <laughs> sitting at home and valuing your life, man. So listen, that puts us up on the end of our interview, uh, uh, Ricky. I appreciate you taking the time to come talk to me in New York Fights. Uh, uh, thank you for your service as a police officer. You you do you 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 went from one profession one profession that showed no love to another profession that shows no love. <laughs> you know, I take my hat off to you. In, you know, in, in both professions, I, I wouldn't want your job. I'd rather sit here and watch you, you no know, referee, man. So thank yeah. you for what you do, man. What what's next? What's what, what's twenty twenty three look like for Ricky? Um, I think I have, I have something coming up in Atlantic city, uh, in June and, um, you know, and it's just start flowing from that point on. <laughs> All right, fight fans. Well, listen, Ricky, thank you for taking time to talk to us. Check thank you. Gonzalez. You'll see him on TV. You see him on TV. If you're a boxer fan, better referee, Ricky Gonzalez. 
uh, Kong got playing Ricky Gonzalez and, 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 and just sitting at home, checking out Netflix, hanging out with 60 year old Ricky Gonzalez. Thank you for your time, man. I'll talk yeah. to you soon. All right. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Standing eight box of podcasts, we discuss every organization and weight class.